Welcome into Coasting with Piven Finer. I'm Evan Pivnik. That's David Fine, the voice of the Reading Royals. And as you can see below us, we have our best dressed guest so far <laughs> here on the podcast. It is the great Michael Doc Emmerich. And Doc, I mean, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to do this for us. And we greatly appreciate it as, uh, you know, you had times where you were broadcasting in the minors and the NHL was just a pipe dream for you. And you end up becoming the guy when it comes to broadcasting in the NHL. And we like to talk about the days where, you know, you were grinding along, you were riding buses, you were, you know, going into different cities every other night at, you know, four o'clock in the morning. What were some of your memories of just traveling in minor league hockey and that hope of the NHL still felt so far away? Well, um, I'm not sure how safe it is for you guys to tell your favorite stories uh, because it might inflict your teams, but maybe you can tell stories about others because I'd love to hear one from each of you before I'm done. Uh, what you remember a lot about are, are about things that don't work out so well or are surprising. And uh, we had some promotions that we did in, um, in the IHL. As a matter of fact, uh, that uh, jersey there is, uh, it's a little hard to see. That's the Port Huron Flags. That was the first team that I worked with for uh, four years in the mid 70s. And uh, we had uh, some promotions where we would uh, have high school bands in to, uh, to play in the stands. And then they could sell tickets for the band fund to their parents. And they would keep 25 cents, uh, you know, it'd probably be more today, out of every ticket that they sold. Well, uh, it wasn't, didn't go too well uh, uh, occasionally. I think one group sold six tickets. And we didn't want to give the band fund a dollar and a half, so we, we sprung for 25. I mean, those are things that happen in uh, the minor leagues where you think something's going to be a really good idea and it turns out not to be. We rolled into Des Moines, December 14th, 1973, and the public relations director said there'll be a 10 minute delay at the end of the first period because we're gonna have a wedding on the ice. The uh, Des Moines Capitals uh, president of the Booster Club is gonna marry one of the members. And that sounded like a great idea. Um, uh, so I interviewed the groom uh, before the game started. So I had some tape to run because I knew I had to fill 10 minutes and the newscast back at the station only took five. But uh, as it turned out, things didn't uh, go according to plan. And when the uh, bride and groom marched off the ice under uh, an arch of hockey sticks held by sweating Des Moines hockey players, it was not the most romantic setting. Uh, at that time, uh, you could throw rice at weddings. It's been discouraged now, uh, but uh, back then you could. Well, they didn't have rice that night in Des Moines, but they had a lot of other things they could throw over the screens, not the glass, but over the screens onto the ice. And it took 45 minutes to clear the ice. That's called guts broadcasting. And I'm sure you guys have had things like that before. Now I'll invite each of you, David and Evan, to tell a story about the miners. But if you can decline if it involves the franchises you're currently working with. I'll go first. Yeah, uh, you start. Uh, good. And uh, it it does, but it will not make any. It will just be a normal miners uh, miners story. How about that? So, uh, in fact, the Reading Royals were uh, leaving uh, uh, to at, leaving Glens Falls, New York, after losing six to two to the Adirondack Thunder. When we found out along the way that we were losing our fifth or sixth player of uh, the weekend. We were to play in Manchester, New Hampshire on a Sunday, cold Sunday. We were driving, only a four hour drive overnight. And uh, I would not normally eat after a game, but I had a feeling that losing all those number of players, I might need something to kind of perk my spirits up. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a, a full sub sandwich, a meatball sub sandwich from a place in Glens Falls, New York on our drive over. The next morning, bleary eyed, you know, we got to play an afternoon game on a Sunday. I looked at uh, Patrick Weller, who's now an assistant coach for the Hershey Bears, formerly our assistant coach with Reading. And I looked at him and we were, we were roommates together that year in 2017, 18. And I said, Pat, um, this is the only time I'll say this to you as the coach, but I, I just don't feel too good about, about today after the results last night, having lost a, a number of folks. And he said, looked at me and I can honestly say this. He looked at me and he said, I don't feel the same way, but we will see what happens out there. And it, as it turned out, the Royals went down two to one or three to one pretty early in the game. 
And I, in the first intermission, I was, you know, tired and it's like, you're excited to be doing your job, but the end of a long road trip and the Reading Royals score five goals in the next six minutes uh, and end up defeating the Manchester Monarchs by three. Clearly not as good of a story as yours, but it was one of no. those. <laughs> anything can happen in the minors stories. We had our goal of the year that day, and uh, that's my story. By the way, on the way up to Glens Falls, as I neglected to mention, our bus broke down and sat on the side of the New York Thruway uh, for about two and a half hours, reloading the bus on the side of 87 as uh, <laughs> yeah, as uh, we prepared to lose to Adirondack. Isn't it awful? I mean, there are always bus breakdown stories, aren't there? Okay, Evan, your turn. All right. Mine's a, mine's a travel story. I've told this on, on the podcast before. I think it's just in little bits, but this was this past year, since we have St. John's Newfoundland in our division, we have to make multiple trips up there and it's a great place. I mean, that place is just unbelievable, but for us to travel with 25, 26 people, plus all the hockey bags is not ideal. So for some reason, everything was going perfect. What we do is we drive to Montreal so we can you know, get through customs that way. So we don't have to do it in the airport. And then we go from Montreal to Toronto and then Toronto to St. John's because that makes it easier for baggage and for the amount of players we're traveling with and staff and whatnot. So everything's going perfect. Our flight leaves on time. We have no problems getting through security, which usually sometimes they give us a hard time. But in Montreal, it's easier because they're deal, they deal with all the hockey teams coming in and out very, very, very often. So we, you know, we we have this monstrous jet that we're on because it is planning on going to Europe after we're after it goes to St. John's. So it's one of those, you know, three seats here, four seats here, three seats here, just a, a jumbo jet to say the least. So we're all kind of spread out in the back. We're all watching, you know, the in-flight movie, and we has like the map of where we are. So uh, we're about thirty minutes away from landing in St. John's, and the pilot gets on the intercom and says. You know, ladies and gentlemen, prepare for descent. We're about to land into St. John's. And this is perfect. We had, you know, dinner plans that night ready to go. Uh, it was the earliest we probably would have ever gotten in during the day in St. John's uh, since it's an hour and a half ahead. Five minutes later, the pilot gets on and says, folks, uh, due to wind and ice on the runway and the size of our plane, we have to turn around and go back to Toronto. Jeez. So three and a half hours into the four hour flight, now we get redirected back to Toronto um, and we land in Toronto. It's about nine o'clock at night now. And we have to figure out how to get onto the next flight the next day, how right. our bags can get there because we don't have our bus anymore since we're now in Toronto. And where are we going to stay tonight? Luckily they put us up in a hotel. Um, the people in the Toronto airport uh, at luggage claim, they said, we can put all your stuff here. We can't guarantee it's safety. But we'll hold it for you. Um, luckily, they did. We came back the next day after being in two separate hotels with me getting multiple text messages from our players saying, uh, Piv, how come we there's one bed and three of us? And I said, I cannot help you with that right now. Um, just go to bed. We have to get up in three hours to get on the next flight. So we did. Um, we got to the airport. Luckily, everything was there. And the baggage claim guys put all our stuff in the containers so it's easier to go. And we got in about one o'clock that afternoon after what I thought, because, you know, overseeing travel, I thought that was going to be the end of my job. <laughs> but uh, luckily we made it on time and I don't believe we did well that week, but we were just happy to be there and have. All I, I guess so. Gosh, what a catastrophe, though, to have that to be rerouted back to Toronto. Yeah, I and, took and a then photo. to have to have to swim for your hotel rooms and, oh. at, at, and everything. Yeah. And, and since it was such a big plane, there were so many other people in the same in the same situation as us. So we had to stand on this line. I had to stand on this line for about an hour and a half and players were coming up to me. Hey, uh, any answers yet? I'm like, I'm still like 300 yards, not at the front of the, <laughs> the right. desk. Like, right. I, I don't know what's going on, but we're able to get everyone on, on flights and, and it worked out well. And we we're just happy to be there. So that's, uh, that's, that's my story. And, and it's different because we were on a plane. I know not a lot of minor league stories like that happen no. uh, on planes, but luckily, you know, it, it, uh, it worked out for us. Uh, in the end. So, thank you yeah. to uh, Air Canada. It's, uh, it, it's all a part of it. I, I remember one of the, uh, I, I have a tendency to ask players that are in the NHL about their favorite story from the minors. And uh, Adam Clendenning told me that, um, uh, Rockford was playing a game against the Chicago Wolves, whose 
home arena is right near O'Hare Airport. And he said, the, the, so we're, we're making this short trip by bus. It's only an hour or so. And just 10 miles out of Rockford, uh, we start to smell smoke. And the bus driver pulls the bus off to the side of the road and we all get out and there's smoke coming out of the back of the bus. Well, fortunately, all the equipment has gone by a separate van ahead of us and it's going to be at the rink, but we're stuck. Uh, so they radio back to Rockford and headed out is uh, a shuttle bus that's taking passengers to O'Hare. And so, so uh, it pulls off to the side of the road and all of us get on this bus that have uh, you know, people that are flying to Florida and, and everything else, mom and pops from all over. And we're trying to wedge our way into the various empty seats that are on this shuttle bus. And uh, we get to O'Hare and we stop at each of the terminals and let them all off. And then the bus driver takes us on over to the rink. But uh, we were fortunate that we got a bus at all to get across from Rockford onto uh, O'Hare and eventually to the rink. So strange things happen. It always seems to happen with travel and you get surprises with buses that break down. Doc, what do you think it is about uh, uh, your style of, of chatting with players, um, with front office members that allowed them to open up to you and, and tell you these funny stories and go into extreme detail in these, fun, in these funny stories and these wonderful stories? I don't know. Um, I think, you know, we, we've all found that one of the great things about the sport that we're involved in are the athletes. And because our job is to be the conduit between the athletes and the fans, uh, they always like stories that are, that are personal. I mean, we could, for example, uh, you could take the number one score in your league and he's on your team and you could go to him and ask him about, so uh, how is this uh, big defenseman on the other team? How do you think he's going to defend you tonight? Well, that'd be interesting. You could fill 10 seconds with that. But if you had a personal story about him that he told you about growing up and how his sister used to be his goaltender and he would shoot on her when he was eight, she was nine and she was weak on the glove side. And so he would always go there. Well, that's kind of a family story and it's fun. And you share that and funny how people remember that. I think in any public speaking thing that people will remember stories more than they remember technology or they remember statistics. And invariably, whenever I started talking to a player, I would try to learn something about his family. And that would be uh, a way that he wasn't used to having a conversation begin. And so maybe that was it, I don't know. But also it helps to have time. And the seven years that I was traveling on buses, that's one thing that you had a lot of. You had time, you were all imprisoned together on the iron lung and so you had lots of time to roam back and forth from one seat to the other not careful not to interrupt the card game uh and uh and you learned more about players then than you did when you traveled separately and they were on charter aircrafts and you were on commercial you had to kind of squeeze in the time that you got after morning practices yeah one of the things especially about being on the buses and from where the staff seating ends and the players seating begins is you usually get the new guys that are sitting directly behind you. So it's kind of like the changing of the guard, you know, as they get older, they migrate towards the back of the bus and you have the newer guys who are, you know, green their first day traveling and you get to kind of pick their brains a little bit. That's one of the things that I always enjoy because you get to kind of have that, you know, the new relationship, like, Hey, you know, you know, what are you concerned about? You know, and a lot of, you know, half the questions are how long until we get there. And I'm like, you can answer that yourself <laughs> with the technology we have now, but um, it, it's just, it's so cool just to be a part of, because you're a part of the, these guys, you know, first expedition on the road in, into a, a new setting, you know, new teammates, and you kind of see them, you know, kind of looking around and seeing, you know, what the experience is like, and you see how great the guys are and welcoming them and inviting them to card games and so on and so forth like that. Yeah, and you're perceived as a as a uh, a friendly um, passenger on the on the bus, and and normally they understand and you understand that what happens on the bus stays on the bus anyway. Especially if a coach chews out a player publicly on the bus, why that doesn't wind up coming off of it. So you're all in this thing together, and you all tend to be friends for that reason too. Uh, I think that's another reason why you get some 
stories that you can share that are helpful to fans. You're not trying to uncover anything, but you're also trying to uh, provide a glimpse of the humanity of the guys who are playing the sport. And that I always found helpful. In the American uh, Hockey League, you had a chance to broadcast with the Maine Mariners uh, now coming back into the league as in uh, Portland, Maine again. Um, now in the ECHL. And Evan and I absolutely love going to the city of Portland, one of the best cities uh, in our division, if not in all of uh, North America, in our opinion. And uh, believe it or not, I'm not sure if you know, but they do still have, uh, not your headshot, but the team photo from some of the years uh, from when we were broadcasting uh, in the AHL with the Maine Mariners. What do you remember about your seasons in, uh, in Portland, Maine? We were a farm team of the Philadelphia Flyers who had only been two years removed from winning two straight championships. And the Flyers were wealthy. They had money and they were going to make a success of that franchise. Ed Snyder, the owner of the Flyers had a summer home in Maine. And we knew that he was a proud man who did not want to come back to Maine in the summertime and hear how poor his team was. He wanted to have a good team there. So we started the first year four, eight, and three in the first 15 games. And general manager Keith Allen uh, called our coach, Bob McCammon, and he said, you're not good enough. And in two weeks time, he had swung four deals, uh, including uh, one for Blake Dunlop, who won the Fred Hunt Award uh, for, uh, for the MVP, and for Terry Murray, who later coached in the NHL. And he won back-to-back -back Eddie Shore trophies for best defenseman. That was how our team improved. From a 4-8-3 and three record, we were in first place by Christmas in our division and won the championship the first year, won the championship the second year, got to the conference final, I guess you would call it by today's standards, the third year. But the New Brunswick Hawks were a combination of, of Toronto and Chicago. And on their roster, they had Daryl Sutter, who would later coach, Bruce Boudreau, who would later coach, Ron Wilson, who would later coach. They were pretty skilled, and we got caught the third year. Otherwise, we'd have run the table three years straight. So spending time in Maine uh, was, was wonderful because it's always great to win, isn't it? And we did a lot of winning in those three years. You got to do a lot of winning in your career when you worked for uh, worked for teams. You know, working as you said with the Maine Mariners, and then you were with the Devils during their almost their dynasty run, if you want to call it that. Just their their those years of success they had. I know David wanted to ask the question, and I'll let him phrase it the way he wants it to. So I'm going to throw it over to him because I know growing up for him, uh, cheering for the Devils. Yes, so I uh, I'm proud exit 151 off the Garden State Parkway. The oh my goodness. Field Nutley exit, uh, and uh, that's how I, I grew up with hockey uh, in New Jersey, and I was fortunate enough that I would, well, I was only two in 1995, but then in 2000, I was seven, and in 2003, um, I met Jim McK McKenzie in person with the cup uh, that fall after the Devils had won the cup in 2003 when I was 10. But the question was, uh, in 1995, broadcasting the games against the Red Wings, there's a certain moment, in, and I've gone back and watched this just a little bit because I was, I was a little too young, um, but uh, Sergey Breland scored a goal, I think that made it 4-2, and then uh, game four of the final, right before the Devils uh, defeated the Red Wings, and then another goal from, uh, Sean, uh, from Tom Chambers, Sean, Sean Chambers. Sean, yeah, started, you're right. 5-2. And there's a certain energy and excitement in your voice that is great for a national broadcaster, but there's a little bit of this is a team that I perhaps just a, a hair of a, this is a team that I'm working for as well. And we might be about to win the cup against the mighty Detroit Red Wings. D what what do you remember about that third period and the, the energy behind the last 15 minutes or so in that game? After it became five to two, um, there was one commercial stoppage uh, that we had. This was before Mike Peluso started crying at the bench and we were showing him. He was so overcome with emotion. He actually, John Davidson, I was working with uh, on Fox and John picked up that Mike had actually missed a shift with Randy McKay and Bobby Olick, he'd missed a shift because his emotions were so 
uh, wrung out. He was crying at the bench because he, at 5-2, you knew that the way the Red Wings played, or the way that uh, the Devils played defensively and with Marty Brodeur in goal, the Red Wings weren't going to get three. And they were going to be swept and there was going to be a championship for Mike and his teammates. But also, during one of those commercial breaks, John Davidson, who had been with the Rangers the year before and broadcast their games when they won, uh, he, he had recognized as you had and most everyone else had uh, you and watching the tape years later that the, Re the Red Wings were going to lose and this was going to be a devil's championship and he said these next few minutes are going to go real fast Mike he said enjoy it and that was his advice and he realized like you did that I was a national spokesman for both teams but he also knew how I'd spent the winter and he said, these next few minutes are going to go fast. Make sure you enjoy them. So uh, that may have been what you were picking up on. But uh, Dick Enberg, the great announcer, uh, always said that some of his best ad libs were written down. And the championship to New, New Jersey, the Devils win the Stanley Cup, was written down on the back of my scorecard. Because I didn't want a moment like that if it came that day to pass without some mention of the state of New Jersey because there hadn't been a championship team from New Jersey before uh, in sports. And so um, that was the reason that that was worked into a, a definite line that I wanted to have written down so that I didn't blow it. Al Michaels, who's one of my great colleagues and has always been so kind to me, uh, made it difficult for all of us in this business, didn't he? Because he came up with lines that will never be, you, you will never improve on what he did in 1980. It was magnificent the way he finished off. Uh, do you believe in miracles? Yes. Uh, how are you ever going to top that? And this impossible dream has come true when they beat the Russians. I mean, uh, and, and the, the miraculous way of, of finishing uh, that game against the Soviets and then, and then when they actually clinched the gold medal the next day, because on the final day, they could have not medaled at all. Uh, and they wound up uh, winning the gold. So he had those two wonderful lines at the conclusion of two games. And none of us will ever approximate that because the gravity of the games that we're doing will probably never reach what was going on at that time. Uh, but we all try to at least make a statement if we have the time to do it and the game is lopsided enough. The many one goal games that I've done in Stanley Cup clinchers, uh, you just simply say the, the winning team has won the Stanley Cup because it's usually frantic near the end with the goalie pulled in a one goal game. And so you don't have the luxury of relaxing and building as we did with St. Louis in game seven over Boston and going back over what all they'd accomplished in the final minute you have when it's evident they're going to win and the bench is celebrating and they're showing those shots that they had uh, changed coaches in November that they were terrible right after the coaching change, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a long exposition and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no, you never have to apologize. One of the questions that I, I want to ask you, and it, and it kind of relates to that, is, you know, you got to broadcast so many terrific moments over the past 20, 25 years, you know, going to the Stanley Cup final, the Stanley Cup final games. If someone comes to you and says, uh, I'm going to come and say and ask this to you, you know, if you had to pick one moment that someone said, what, if you had a, if you had a kind of phrase what is Mike Emmerich in terms of calling a big moment like that? What moment would you point them to and say, I'm most proud of this. This is what I want the world to know that Mike Emmerich is when it comes to calling a big moment. I don't, I, I leave that up to the people that are watching and, and if uh, they want to somehow or other put it into, into words, that's wonderful of them to do. I will say this. The proudest I was to be around hockey, and I've been proud to be around hockey a, a lot of times when I've been doing games. The proudest I was was uh, of, of hockey and, and its players was the gold medal game in 2010 because we had the chance to show the sport to so many people as 27 million. 
which was a record, I think, going back to the Al Michaels year in, in 1980 uh, for any telecast of a hockey game in the United States. And it, it, it was a Sunday afternoon. It was uh, the closing ceremonies were going to happen shortly anyway. Uh, but we had the ideal situation because the game went into the final minute. The goalie was pulled. It was one goal game. And then Zach Parisi scored and forced overtime. Then we had the intermission and there were more viewers building during the intermission. And then in, uh, in the overtime, Sidney Crosby scored and Canada won. And then we had more time. And during that time, Pierre did some interviews with both Crosby and with the losing goaltender, Ryan Miller. And they both spoke really well. And I think eloquently about the playoffs about the game they just played and and about the Olympics and 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 in general and I thought out of 27 million I have no idea how many of that 27 million hadn't watched hockey much that year but they were watching it that day and they got to see a thrilling game they got to see an overtime win they're going to see the medals presented and they got to hear two of our best spokesmen talk about the sport and so I don't remember that much about what I said, but I do remember being very proud about being around hockey and about players uh, that day in Vancouver. And it was late in the afternoon back east. And so the maximum number of people could watch that game in all time zones in the United States, including Hawaii, where it was still late morning. So that's why. Doc, this has been an absolute a blast. Thank you for taking 30 minutes out of your uh, out of your busy day to to make it happen. And we really appreciate you hopping on episode number 16 of Coasting with us. Number 16. Okay, Eddie Olchek's number, Bobby <laughs> Clark's number. Uh, who is who is 16 for who is 16 for Reading? Who is 16 for uh, Adirondack? Uh, probably uh, maybe 16 isn't taken. 16. Yep. For the Reading Royals last season in 2019-20 uh, was Hayden Hodgson from uh, Leamington, Ontario, a good player from the OHL who uh, may have had a part in a few uh, fights against uh, Evans Adirondack Thunder. <laughs> especially ah, very good. Very notable preseason game back, yep. in, uh, back in 2019 where there was uh, some a little bit extra in the final few minutes. So. Yeah, oh, we, nice. yeah that, that was a fun one. Number 16 for the Adirondack Thunder is a player named Pete MacArthur, Peter MacArthur, if you want to go full, uh, full name. He is from Clifton Park, New York. He is, I believe, 35 this uh, turning 35 this year. Uh, been around for a while. He played uh, in college uh, for for BU. Um, he, you know, he's kind of one of those guys who's been there, done that. He made it to the AHL, played for Bridgeport for a little bit, spent a lot of time in Texas where um, his wife is a uh, – uh, an anchor on the morning, uh, I believe it was the morning show there, but now, uh, you know, they're, they're coming back to New York. The whole family is, and, uh, it was good to have him back. I know we didn't get to play this year, but he's probably one of the best guys that we've had in terms of, you know, on the ice performance and also off the ice as a kind of a spokesman, as kind of a face of a franchise. And, uh, he's already committed to coming back, uh, this upcoming year at the, I believe it'll be eighth you're age 35, 36 for him. So wow. it's going to be nice to have him back. And he's just one of those, you know, always positive around the locker room. Um, he's the guy to talk to for new guys coming in. He's just so welcoming. And, you know, it's funny because he, he wasn't there my first year, but he was there, I think the two years before that. So I kind of heard these, these stories about Peter MacArthur. And then he, they, uh, he signed my second year. And he was just the nicest guy in the world. I was like, okay, this is why everyone talks about him. And of course, him being, you know, only 40, you growing up only 45 minutes away from where we are now, you know, it puts the whole bow on it. So of he's course. number 16 for the Thunder. So you guys are amazing that not only do you have, uh, do you have the names and numbers, but also backgrounds. So I'm impressed. Uh, I would have, uh, I would have been disappointed had you not had all of this great information, but I'm heartened that you do. Well, it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad we didn't disappoint you with our, <laughs> with our knowledge. <laughs> no, but, you're all over it. Excellent. This has been Coasting with the great Mike Doc Emmerich. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week on Coasting presented by Flow Hockey TV.